good to meet you, Scott. You as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Worked fine this morning, so hopefully it works fine. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much. We've got about five minutes before we get started, so if you're still answering those work Slack messages or checking your email, you've still got time. Keep going. And my coworkers haven't arrived yet, so not that I'm going to hold that over their head if they don't show up. Enjoy. Thank you.
All right, everybody. We've hit 2.50 on the clock. We've got 25 minutes. And let's get started so that we can all move on to the next session and then the after parties tonight. Everybody enjoy lunch so far? Yeah. DrupalCon so far? Yeah. Wonderful. This is Running Drupal in Hostile Environments. My name is Brian Thompson. I'm the director of web engineering at a company called MindGrub. I've been working with WebTech since 2006. If you want to find me on Twitter, there you go. I'm a baker, an outdoorsman, a tech nerd. I frequently find myself in complex technical problems where I wonder how I got myself into these problems. Um, so then I put myself outdoors as far away from technology as I can so that I can leave those problems behind. So I was putting together the, the talk here and thinking about and reflecting on, on my experiences. The concept kept resonating with me. How many people help their clients or even help themselves with hosting for their Drupal websites? Pretty much good majority of the crowd, excellent. How many people um, have a preferred hosting provider that they would use if given the choice to host their Drupal website? Whatever that may be. How many people, How many people ask the client and let the client sort of guide them into the hosting that the client would like to use? <laughs> very good. You're all very... Sometimes the client does force it, and they, sometimes they have legitimate reasons for it, right? And as much as we would like to, to use a Drupal-friendly solution, whether that's one of the three diamond sponsors at, at DrupalCon this year, Pantheon, Acquia, Platform SH, or any of the other number of fantastic hosting companies um, in the exhibit hall, or less than fantastic hosting companies in the exhibit hall, um, you know, the advantage of using the, these friendly Drupal ones are that they give you lots of different things for that. They've got caching built in, whether that's Redis or Memcache or some object caching layer. They've got solid state drives so that the code in the database runs fast. They're running modern versions of PHP. And they're really leaving those shared hosting providers at $3.99 a month behind, which might not be caught up. But as you work on, on more and more Drupal sites, what we encountered as we were working on them is sometimes we would find ourselves in conversations with people like this, the corporate IT team, who like to have their own data centers running in their buildings with their own servers because they have their own staff, and they believe that because they host everything else, they should just host their Drupal site alongside everything else they're hosting. And maybe they have legitimate reasons for it because they've got security compliance concerns that would be a uh, problematic if they host it elsewhere. Maybe it's because they want to integrate with LDAP or some other sign-on service that's not available outside their firewall. But whatever the case may be, you end up with these corporate IT individuals who like to, to push you in a certain direction for hosting. And so we had this, this one that sent me this email. And when I mentioned to them, you know, time to talk about hosting, they wrote back, Brian, we host all our own applications. Please confirm you will send us the installer for us to install your application, which had me scratching my head. And then the follow-up to that email, which came in just a few minutes later, and please let me know how many DB2 licenses we should provision for you. It was about my reaction. Um, and I'm sitting there thinking, OK, Drupal application, installer, DB2, these are things that you know, I, my father used to tell me about as a kid of provisioning DB2 licenses. <clears throat> if you ask me to license a database server, I tell you open source. Pick my SQL. Maybe you want MariaDB instead. OK, you really want to go the Postgres route. It's not something that I, I think a lot about from a licensing standpoint. So I, I very nicely write back to them. I've tried to anonymize this a little bit just so that my clients don't get too unhappy about me talking about them. Uh, but I say, hi, CTO. We were originally planning on hosting the Drupal site for you on Lightning, which is a cloud provider. Can you confirm you prefer to self-host? Also, Drupal uses MySQL for its database, not DB2, so we won't need any DB2 licenses. I'm like, great, problem solved. We sent this off, hopefully. They've got their Linux servers. They can give us a MySQL install somewhere, somehow. Life will be good. A few hours later, I get back a response. 
Our security team does not allow cloud hosting. It is insecure. MySQL is not allowed in our data center. We use DB2 for everything, but could probably get an exception made for Postgres. And that prompts lots of different questions in your head, like how secure are the rest of my sites running in the cloud and the millions of others running on cloud providers that makes their so secure by hosting internally. And if we can get an exception made for Postgres, why can't we just get an exception made for MySQL? Let's take the form where you wrote in the word Postgres and scratch it out and write MySQL and then submit that to the security team and see what they say. But there are a couple of key takeaways from this, some lessons learned from this experience, if you will. The first is, it's always good to figure out hosting at the start of the project. This was maybe a few months in. We were nowhere near the end of the project, which would have made this a lot worse. But even still, being a month or two into the project and switching database engines on this Drupal site from MySQL to Postgres, there are a couple of intricacies to work out. And while we might advertise that we support Postgres as a database engine, and Core does, for the most part, support Postgres as a database engine, the contrib modules, including views on this Drupal 7 site that we're talking about, not so much. And then it also led us down this fine path of how do we build an executable installer for Drupal, including installing all of our customizations and modules in the theme and so forth. And after talking to them for quite some time and going back and forth, we finally convinced them that hosting on, on Windows was not the best solution for them. And that instead they were, they were okay hosting on Red Hat Linux because after all, they pay a licensing fee for that as well, so therefore it must be, must be good. And then we went down that path of trying to explain to them what features were and what Drush was for all of that so that they could have their executable-like installer to set everything up. We never did write an EXE installer for Drupal, and I never planned to. But as we went along, and we were nearing launch and we were shipping them final versions for their testing on their systems, they decided they wanted to do performance testing. After all, this was a fairly large company, nationwide, a couple thousand users using the site simultaneously. So of course, naturally, I get an email like this. Brian, load testing has been completed using Enterprise Tool. Enterprise Tool was a paid licensed product that of course I just don't have sitting around in my performance testing toolbox because it costs a couple thousand dollars per test. But they were kind enough to, to tell me that they use that tool. And with four web servers, the site can an only handle three users simultaneously. This is unacceptable. And I cut a few exclamation points out of there so it would fit on the slide. We will have thousands of people using this daily. And as I'm looking at this, from the, from the CTO, the immediate thing that jumps out at me is four web servers, three simultaneous connections. What's the fourth web server doing? <laughs> I just don't under, understand. You've got four web servers. How can we only handle three simultaneously? And don't get me wrong, three is bad. <laughs> three is nowhere near good, especially with four web servers. But your IT team is the one who's been handling this entire setup. We have no access to your data center. We don't know what your servers look like besides what you've actually um, told us just in conversation back and forth, which is not very much. So I write back, hi CTO, can you share more information on the hosting? We just ran load tests using JMeter on our infrastructure, which was cloud-based. Um, and a single webhead was handling upwards of a couple hundred connections all fine and good. Wonderful. And so, cutting a few emails out back and forth here about the differences between an enterprise hosting tool and JMeter, and why one is inherently insecure and bad and awful because you can't pay a licensing fee for it. <laughs> Eventually, we get to this email which they send me back regarding the configuration. Brian, stock Apache configuration. Everything runs on spinning disk hard drives. If we need to move particular database tables onto solid state drives, please advise. 
We don't put application code on solid state drives because of cost. This is the first time somebody's ever told me that a Drupal site, and not the uploaded files, but just the code for a Drupal site, is too expensive to host on solid state drives that we therefore must use spinning disk hard drives because of cost. Mind you, this is a big Fortune 100, Fortune 500 company that's telling us this, and they rightfully pointed out that they do have petabytes worth of data, and to have solid state drives for petabytes worth of data would be expensive. But we're talking about a Drupal site that's got, at most, 100 megabytes of code, and that's if I round up in increments of 100. <laughs> so I write back. We normally run everything on solid state drives, and our tests were based on everything on solid state drives. You might need to tune your Apache configuration. It looks like your server is using all of its Apache threads, serving the five gigabyte video your content team put on the second page. And so what was happening there, enterprise testing tool was loading the home page and then navigating to a sub page. And as part of that was trying to fully load all the content on those sub pages, including the super high resolution video tutorial that auto loads, auto plays, auto downloads. And therefore it's not actually Apache that's getting throttled in this case, but the network bandwidth coming out of their servers. <laughs> Despite the fact that they were using this on a local network with one gig LAN speed back and forth. But the lessons out of all of this are solid state drives matter quite a bit. If we remove the content piece from the equation, we were seeing performance improvements of threefold between their infrastructure and our infrastructure with the exact same configuration, exact same versions of Apache, exact same version of PHP, which was 5.3 by the way, and exact same versions of Postgres with the only difference between them being the solid state drives running them back and forth. <coughs> we also were reminded that default configurations are just that, the default configuration. And if you want to have the most optimal performance out of a particular web server, you're probably best off tuning that configuration file. And luckily, because this was such a large company, they had countless IT admins who understood the Apache configuration forwards and backwards that once we could actually talk to them, were very quick to point out that they were using the default Apache configuration and that was probably bad. But it also again reminded us that Apache is really bad at serving large files. And that even putting something as simple as Varnish or Nginx in front of Apache to handle that static file serving would have been much more efficient in terms of CPU load once we mitigated the bandwidth concerns. So that's story number one of hosting Drupal in a hostile environment. The second story, which is equally enjoyable and has some fun lessons learned coming out of it, was a fantasy football application. This project was not for the NFL. I'm not just saying that, it truly was not for the NFL. It was a Drupal 8 site. It was a narrower audience than your standard fantasy providers, so smaller audience than say ESPN or Yahoo or somebody else who runs large scale fantasy applications. And they had done this for a few years in the past. And their existing vendor decided they had enough. Four weeks before the first game of the season in September. So they turned to us because we did a number of their other web properties. So the goal of this project was to design and build a fantasy football pick -em application in four weeks. Very small audience, you just make picks, picks lock in, you award points and at the end you declare a winner. How hard could it be? Yeah. Exactly. So they send me about two weeks into the project, which mind you is two weeks before launch. Brian, can you confirm the new application can run on Microsoft Azure App Services? It's just like Heroku. <laughs> Those were their words to me. And it was like, well, we're on a really compressed timeline. We were originally planning on hosting the site on our preferred cloud provider. But if everything else you have is in Azure, which it was, including all of their backend office payment systems, the way their restaurant management systems worked, and countless other systems, we can probably make that work. After all, it's just like Heroku. <laughs> so they write back, 
Great, I just sent you an invite to join our Azure account. You should find our existing app services cluster in there. It was Windows, by the way. And then they also added one this extra line with it. I also went ahead and had our tech gal give you permission to create additional databases in our SQL Server instance. And at this point we've gone from, oh, well we have something that's just like Heroku to something that's nowhere near. And as the project team on this project was asking me, what on earth are we doing? And I was asking myself what on earth we had gotten into on a compressed timeline for something that's just like Heroku, but not at all. How do we go about doing this? So if you ever find yourself trying to host a Drupal 8 site with Microsoft SQL Server, what you will discover is actually that there's a Drupal SQL Serve module for both Drupal 8 and Drupal 7. There are two versions of this module within each of them, the 8.1x line and the 8.2x line. The difference between the two of them is actually which PDO library they use to communicate back and forth with SQL Server. The 8.1x version use a free open source version um, made by Microsoft on Microsoft's GitHub account to do the actual PDO layer back and forth. And if you use the 8.2 version, then you can buy a separate PDO driver from the makers of this module for 125 euros. But you get it for life. And they advertise that their system is continuously tested. So, being the good open source people that we are on this Drupal 8 project with a compressed timeline, we download version 8.1x, the free version, we throw it on the site, we transfer it into a Microsoft environment with a SQL Server backend, and we get this, which everybody who's developed Drupal 8 sites has probably seen maybe once or twice. And as we were digging into it, what we discovered is that using this 8.1x line of the module, you're unable to update entities. You can create them just fine, but if you ever have to update them, you're in trouble. And so then that led us down this path of, of thinking and scratching our heads. Do people really need to update entities on this website? The menu system uses the entity system underneath, but in that case we could just delete the menu link and recreate it because we were managing this for them throughout the season anyway, so could we live with that in the short term? Yeah, that concept lasted about 24 hours before we decided that for 125 euros, let's see what's going on. And what you discover when you get the 125 euro version of the PDO layer is that MySQL and Microsoft SQL have a very distinct difference between them. In our databases we have primary keys, normally the node ID or the ND ID of what that may be. You have the same thing in SQL Server. According to the official SQL standards, which are super boring and I suggest you not read, you can never update the primary key of a row in your database table once it's been created. You can never specify what that new primary key value is in an update statement. Now I'm sure you're saying, Brian, I've looked at the Drupal MySQL driver and I've seen the SQL queries it makes when I save a node, and sure enough, it sets the SQL or the NID value to the exact same thing it was because all the uh, and the abstraction layer does is take all of the properties on my node and convert them into the, the update statement. And you would be correct. However, Microsoft SQL has decided that you shouldn't do that because the SQL compliance docs or the SQL standards say that you can never update that. So if you write a SQL query or you let Drupal write a SQL query for you by doing entity save on an existing entity, it gets a little upset. The 2.x version solves that it's the best 125 euros we've ever spent on a project. <laughs> totally saved our life. If you need to do Drupal with Microsoft SQL Server, I recommend you go that route. A few days before launch, the project team sends me this email. Performance of app services is really bad. 60 plus seconds to load a page, 15 minutes for git push to deploy. After all, it's just like Heroku, so you git push to deploy your code. Anything we can do to improve this? I'm like, well, that's a loaded question. 
sure the client won't be happy when their pages take 60 seconds to load. And of course, on our preferred hosting, we're talking sub-second page load times. So we dig into it. First things first, how do we speed up the team for deployments? If you find yourself using Azure App Services, what you will find when you spend a Saturday digging into things is that you have to push to get over HTTPS, not SSH. Why? Because it's Microsoft and therefore Git doesn't support SSH on Microsoft. What you'll also find is that when it does this push, it pushes it to a Git repository hosted by Microsoft and then copies every file in your Git repository to a network file share system so that there's a copy of it to run on the app server servers themselves, and then just mounts that network file share to each of your servers that are running this in your containers, containers in quotation marks. And if there's one thing I remember from my first DrupalCon way back in Portland in 2013, it's that running Drupal on a network file share is really bad. And that's the way Azure App Services is architected. And that's how the documentation says it works. So I send this great email back to the project team. Apparently App Services just uses an NFS mount for all code versus doing a git checkout like Heroku does. I guess it isn't just like Heroku. I'll see what other options exist, maybe PHP file caching or something. So that leads me down the path of Stack Overflow and another Saturday afternoon reading through documentation written by Microsoft engineers on a Microsoft blog about how they've actually built this to find a couple of different lessons. One, the Azure documentation is lacking, to say the least. But if you find the right blog post written by the right Microsoft engineer, they will tell you about this environment variable you can set in your configuration called website local cache option which if you set this environment variable and you set it to true, will take all of those files on your network file share and copy them over to the physical hard drives of each of your web heads so that you get native disk speed, which is actually solid state drives, believe it or not. Of course, in doing this, you give up all forms of shared storage, which means that site default files directory where users were uploading files, yeah, that's no longer shared between all your web heads. In our case, this didn't matter. There was no user uploaded content. It was something we were willing to live without, so we proceeded on. The other lesson we learned is that SQL Server provisions in these things called DTUs, or database transaction units. Essentially, instead of provisioning based on total CPU or RAM or disk space that you're using, it's how many queries per second you can run. If you're using the database as a cache in Drupal 8, that might mean you've got a couple hundred queries per request as it retrieves all that cache data. Which, when you provision by query, is bad. So I send a great email back. Biggest issue now is caching. We either need to substantially upsize the database or figure out another option. Azure office offers Redis, but according to the docs, you have to leverage their Redis to memcache library so your app code thinks it is talking to memcache even though it is talking to Redis. And mind you, I pulled that from the WordPress documentation because they didn't have Drupal documentation for running Drupal on Azure. So what did we learn? Ignore the Azure docs, just have Drupal treat Redis as Redis. And don't add any sort of abstraction layer. The lowest level Redis plans on Azure, which are only a couple of dollars, will save you hundreds on your SQL server bill. We took and put a one gig Redis instance and replaced a top tier SQL Server instance with the lowest tier SQL Server instance and the site flew back and forth. Much, much better. Which resulted in this one final email back and forth. Brian, the site is looking good. As a heads up, we're gonna promote the site to our mailing list this afternoon. Roughly 800,000 emails. But because of all of this, the site held up through it Hopefully my pain and my suffering will eventually be your gain one day. Constantly remind your clients that the reason you recommend certain hosting providers is because you know how they work and you know who to talk to to get results when you have problems. And enjoy the rest of DrupalCon.
I think we are pushed for time on questions, but I'll hang out down the front here or in the back once the next one starts, or feel free to stop me in the hallway, ask me questions if you ever have problems with hosting providers or you're looking for um, key information. My email address is on the screen. You can tweet at me. Feel free to, to reach out. I will help however I can. Well, we have about half an hour to the next session, so. I'll take questions then. As long as the next speaker is in here ready to kick me off the stage, oh, okay, I'll keep right. going. So, you know, I mean, I, I work at a fairly large organization in, in, in the IT support division of that, right? And, uh, I mean, we're, we're thankfully pretty open source friendly and stuff, so that, thankfully none of those hellish scenarios, right? But, you know, we, I'm curious, in, in dealing with your large clients, have you ever talked to somebody who is like an enterprise architect or something like that? We have. We've invoked enterprise architects from cloud hosting providers. We've but what about on your client side? We've invoked them as well. Um, what we find struggles there is that the enterprise architects come from the IT side of the house, and we're often not working directly with the IT side of the house. The IT department is not our client, and we get into this interesting scenario a lot of times where it might be the marketing department or some other sub-department that is our direct client who is paying us to build the website, but it's going to be the IT department that is responsible for hosting the website long-term. Right. And so from a budget standpoint, the build of the website comes out of that one department, but the hosting of the website comes out of the IT department's budget. Right, but obviously you're, I mean, the, the marketing and the public affairs and all the divisions, like, I mean, they just don't care about it. I, and, and I understand why. I mean, it really makes a lot of sense. But, like, I mean, I, obviously, we're, you know, we're on the IT side. I, I'm mostly a developer, but I do interact with the enterprise architecture team a lot. And, um, you know, so we get, we tend to get a little frustrated at, you know, that, that it all has to go through the, the public affairs, you know, and um, it, it's just, one of those things that I think that from on the, uh, you know, on the agency side and everything that, I don't know, my observation is that I, I really feel like you guys need to be pushing back with the with your internal clients or, or your, your clients, our internal clients, right? But a little bit more being like, hey, we really got to get this technology stack underway before we do this project to help work out those kinks. I mean, because if if you if obviously I DB two. Our SQL Server was their recommended and preferred in-house solution, right? Sure. But if most of these things have got a formal um, enterprise architecture practice, there's probably some sort of governing board or something but by via which you could formally get an exception, right? Mm-hmm. You, and you tell tell them that, and be like, you got you mean, need to understand what is your preferred technology stack first as, as part of the project kickoff, and because they just a lot of the marketing departments are like, well, it's a web server, it'll work. I, I agree 100%. You know? And in fact, one of my other key takeaways is that we have to dive into the nitty gritty stuff right away. So and obviously, we, the marketing people don't want to do that because they're like, well, it's just nerd stuff. Right. Or even when you talk with the enterprise architect and you say, oh, you know, we're going to build this Drupal application or we're going to build whatever type of application, they're like, great, it's a web application. We run lots of web applications. We should be good to go. It's like, I don't think you understand what you're committing yourself to with that statement but I now have it in writing from you. True. Um, but there is certainly an education piece and a conversation to be had around what are you using for everything else? Right, I mean, I've been working with Drupal for nearly 10 years now, so whenever we kick off a project, you know, like at least our EA team knows, don't just assume anything, come and talk to the Drupal team and everything. But uh, I mean, we're also not for profit, so we have less, uh, <laughs> less urgency sometimes. <laughs> Fair enough. We, uh, I would say for a large number of our enterprise clients, including the ones from the presentation here, um, this was their first experience into Drupal. Um, one of them had lots of Java applications and a few SharePoint websites, which we were like, yeah, I don't think so. Um, and the other one had a conglomeration of a Ruby thing, a Python thing, a Node thing, and something else. Because in that case, um, in the one that was much more varied, they didn't have a full-blown tech team in-house. 
they just kept going from vendor to vendor, and vendor to vendor was each using what they liked best, um, or what they knew best, I suppose, from that regard. Um, but that results in some interesting challenges around hosting. And you know, in our case, it was the, the CMO we were working back and forth with. They had one tech person who I am pretty convinced was just on a retainer. Um, <laughs> But uh, you know, so it's like okay, we're gonna we're gonna sync up the the SQL Server, then that's the database we got. So I'll just provision you another user. That's all I need to do. Um, versus being embedded on a day to day basis and trying to steer that ship in a good direction. Yeah, a no, direction. I mean, there there's obviously like a lot of. I mean, as much as Drupal is trying to get off the island, I think there's still a lot of. Um, I know, so there's still some islands left. One or two, or three, or maybe a few more. Yeah, at, least, at least half a dozen. Easily. Yeah. Maybe two handfuls. <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you. Hey, I feel your pain. I've been there. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, just a couple questions. So on the Azure one, uh, I understand you had kind of a compressed timeline. Did you ever talk to them about moving it over to kind of, because I know you can install like Ubuntu or whatever flavor of Linux you want on there. I, was it, uh, I guess, was that ever suggested in that kind of model? It was, um, and in fact, when they first said Microsoft or Azure, I was like, okay, we'll spin yeah. up some Linux virtual servers, we'll throw MySQL on them, we'll install a LAMP stack or a LAMP stack or we'll put Varnish in front of it or whatever, and then we, slowly started diving more and more into what we mean by using Azure is we don't want to increase our bill. Right. Even though we're going to host this application that will be super high traffic on Thursdays and Sundays, and we're going to promote that to a mailing list of 800,000 people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in fairness, their site, when it launched and they promoted it, you know, I want to say we had close to 10,000 users sign up in the first hour after that email went out. Um, but it was more of a financial, we want to keep it running on the things we have. And as we go into year two of this application, um, there will be a lot more opportunities for shifting things around. Mm -hmm. um, we were also a new vendor for them at the time. And so there was a, we were navigating it carefully. Um, and now that we've built up much more rapport with them, those recommendations will be substantially stronger. We no. tried to push them towards that. They didn't really seem keen to it. Now that they've seen how much pain we went through to get it running for them in the first place, it probably would have been cheaper for them in the long run, too. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. But yep. you know, that's a very hard cost for people to realize because all they see is what's advertised when the... Azure homepage of free or right. pennies on the dollar. Right. Um, yeah. And less, they see less of the, we're going to invoice you for eight hours, 16 hours, however many hours worth of work to set this up in this non standard configuration. Right, right. And I think around the first one when you had the entrenched IT, like the on prem hosting, yep. um, it just, just in, in general, we've run into that sometimes too at our agency. And nine times out of 10, what we end up doing is um, uh, most of those kind of diamond partners have some sort of SLA or some other thing, even if there's the bias around cloud hosting, um, uh, trying to find an end runaround of that decision maker to try to get them to, to either at least communicate with one of them from that front and then say, well, you know, the federal government sites are on there or, you know, something like that. Look at all these other people who have managed to deem it appropriate. Right. Yeah. Like these little websites like Google or Apple or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Small ones. <laughs> yeah, small. Anyway, cool. Thanks. No problem. Thank you. Are we out of time or do we have more time? I haven't been kicked off stage yet. Okay. And Scott, um, the staff guy, stopped by, looked at me, and then kept on walking. So, so not really a question, but uh, so I work for a state agency, and we, have, we are in the most hostile environment possible. <laughs> Windows, IIS, SQL Server. Oh, so uh, one thing we found that actually kind of helps is in 
moving forward, uh, presenting Drupal, PHP, and MySQL as a COTS product, commercial off-the-shelf bundle, and if you present it like that, and if you ask for approval like that, it sometimes helps um, to get around the, you know, we only use DB2, or we only use this or that. So hopefully that helps you guys. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Thank you so much. This is the obligatory sprint slide. Don't forget the sprints on Friday. In the obligatory, please rate the session and DrupalCon online. Thanks, everybody. definitely saved us from some oddities in the way Drupal was trying to handle SQL queries. And yeah, we run into the primary issue. The guy who wrote it has been super responsive and like there was an issue with date deal in D8. Run into that too. He squared that away. I'm sure he's doing some hacky things in it to parse it into MS SQL compliant SQL, but works for me. I grab my bag and get out of the Nah, you're okay. Always. Uh, my sequel actually doesn't follow the spec, uh, which I found hard to believe until I went looking into it. I assumed that. Um,
Hey, how are you? Uh, I'm doing great. Oh, absolutely. Is there 